This looks like just another computer terminal, but this terminal is hooked up to a television production facility. Indeed, computers are all over television stations these days, for without them, you wouldn't be able to see all those fancy special effects, like this one. How do they do it? We'll find out today as we take a look at computers and the media on this edition of the Computer Chronicles. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte the international standard. Welcome to the Computer Chronicles. I'm Stuart Chaffe. Gary Kildall is off this week and sitting in for Gary is George Morrow. George, what we're doing here is checking some late news headlines and sports scores on the AP wire via CompuServe. Now in the past, if I wanted this kind of information, I'd have to run down to the corner store and get a newspaper or turn on my radio and TV and wait for them to give me that information. Now I can get it whenever I want it. There's been a lot of talk about the electronic delivery of the newspaper, but not much has really happened. Do you think anything will happen there? I don't think people are going to give up papers, Stuart. But uh, certainly, if you put these computer uh, access services, hook it up with a laser printer, with the prices of these things, pretty soon not only will you have a high phone bill, but you'll keep your paper <laughs> bill right up where it was. <laughs> and I'd be able to, in fact, custom make the newspaper, probably right. tell it what stories I like and what stories I don't like. That's right. Well, our subject today is computers and the media, and we're going to find out the effect of computers in radio, television, and the newspapers. First of all, we're going to take a look at the first television station in the country which completely computerized its news operation. At KRON-TV in San Francisco, computers have become an integral part of the newsroom's operation. Faced with the daily task of sorting through mountains of information, the news department seems a natural choice for computers. But KRON is one of the very few stations to automate almost every aspect of its news center. A reporter on arriving at work can obtain instantly his assignment, the stories being worked on that day, and any messages waiting for him. Replacing the familiar clickety-clack of a teletype, the system carries wire service bulletins throughout the day, signaled by discrete beeps at each terminal. The job of covering news events is not, however, entirely electronic. A good part of the day is spent on location, with a camera and a notepad on hand. But the suggestion of protecting this legislation seemed to be successful. Reporters still ask questions and listen for revealing comments. But with as many as 40 reporters in the field at one time and fast-breaking stories arriving throughout the day, the computer streamlines the job. In the three-plus years they've had the, the computers here, people have forgotten what it was like uh, to do it without computers. And uh, every once in a while when there's a little glitch, and uh, people think they might have to use typewriters again. There is a panic, the likes of which uh, you've never seen before. It, it speed things up immeasurably, uh, and in all sorts of subtle ways that, uh, that are difficult to measure. Instead of having to get up from your desk and walk over to a clipboard someplace where the wire service copy has been clipped up, you just sit here and bingo, you get it. Well, how much time does that save you? I mean, does that save you a minute? Does that save you two minutes? It doesn't seem like a big increment, um, but it adds up. Even more important, what it does is it encourages you to have, to gain access to all of the information that's available to you. While at work on a story, a reporter can check the latest developments coming across the wire services, list subtitles, and specify the pictures that will accompany the text. This information is then immediately accessible to the producers, editors, and artists who determine the final shape of the videotape package. Another part of television that the computer has changed forever is the newsroom's closest partner, the art department. Instead of slides or rough sketches, computer graphics accompany the text of a news story. 
Artwork and photos are combined to create a fast, flexible electronic library with a polished look. But behind all of the computing power and convenience, the sophistication of a network that links offices from San Francisco to Washington is one overriding concern. It's the speed, and in this business, speed is very important. We, we score our victories here in, in minutes rather than in days, and if uh, you're on the air uh, five minutes, three minutes ahead of somebody else with the big story, then you won. And now, from the West's most honored newsroom, the News Center for Northern California, this is Live at Five. You might expect television stations to have lots of computers. That's a high-tech business. But what about good old-fashioned newspapers? Well, even the print side of the media business is full of computers these days, and there's probably no better example of a computerized newspaper than USA Today. Without computers, USA Today would not be able to produce the kind of newspaper that we do. Uh, the computers in this room um, are used to collect news and information from major wire uh, companies such as the Associated Press, United Press International, Gannett's own Gannett News Service. We receive information from Gannett's other 85 daily newspapers. We can receive data and information from reporters traveling in the field using portable computers. All that information is fed into this one computer source. Uh, once the pages are created and produced, Computers are then used to take a facsimile image and convert it in a digital format so that in one quarter of a second it's shot 22,000 miles into space and bounced off of West Star 3 and then another uh, quarter of a second is travels another 22,000 miles to the various print sites all around the country. The USA Today system consists of 12 DEC 1134s using proprietary software. All 12 minis are networked and serve only the editorial functions of the paper. Gannett has a mainframe system which it uses for corporate purposes, data processing, payroll, and so on. While USA Today is probably the most computerized newspaper in the country, it still does some basic things the old-fashioned way, like page composition and layout. But Ray Douglas says he hopes to enhance their computer system so that it can take over those tasks too. Well, the reason for the enhancements and going to things like what we call news layout, which some people may call pagination, is that that kind of product helps us produce a better paper um, and helps us be able to create and make changes at a later deadline so that our readers get a more up-to-date, a more precise and exact product. USA Today is famous for its use of color, and Ray Douglas is now experimenting with a computer system that lets photographers in the field transmit color photos back to the paper in the same way reporters now transmit text. We also see using computers to transmit color photographs directly into our computers here so that we can, tre we can treat uh, color photographs much the same way we treat news stories where we can transmit a news story in a matter of minutes so that we can get a news story into the newspaper just before deadline, we expect in the short term to be able to treat photographs the same way, be able to transmit electronically photographs and get them included in the newspaper so that in the morning when that reader picks up that paper, he not only has the most up-to-date news information, but has the most up-to-date color photographs as well. Perhaps the most important part of USA Today's computer operation is its ability to transmit pages via satellite to 30 printing sites around the country. Computer-controlled color laser scanners transmit the pages with a resolution of 1,400 lines per inch. The transmissions are then received a split second later by computer-controlled reconstructors, which check for errors, automatically ask for the retransmission of faulty scan lines, and then produce a negative for the making of the final plates to print the paper. George, you know, the interesting thing about USA Today, the paper is, is perhaps best known for its, its graphics like this and the weather chart that everybody knows in USA Today. But despite all the use of computers at that paper, right now these charts are still being done by artists sitting at a, at a desk. Probably, probably has to do with reliability. You know, the microprocessors have been around since the mid-70s. But it's only now that uh, people like the government and probably the communications people feel comfortable enough with the technology 
to really begin to rely on it. You don't want your television program going haywire right in the middle of a segment. Well, you can't miss your newspaper deadline, I guess, either That's if the right. computer <laughs> decides not That's to work. That's right. Well, we've talked about newspapers and television so far. In fact, the first broadcast station in the country to completely computerize was a radio station, the all-news CBS radio station here in San Francisco. Wendy Woods went to KCBS and has a report on how they use their computers. KCBS News Time 936, Bob Hallman and Joan Ravier with KCBS Weather and Traffic in one minute. At KCBS Radio in San Francisco, everything you hear, reports from wire services, from reporters, the rewrites, the edited copy, and the very structure of each program is compiled and written on computer. Even the anchors read copy either printed out or directly from their terminals. KCBS was not only the first station in the country, but the first broadcast station to computerize. It's a virtually paperless newsroom and a model for the rest. This station has 12 terminals hooked up to a new star mini computer. The system has 140 megabytes of storage, or enough for a good two years worth of stories. The system has worked virtually bug free since 1979. It's very reliable, which is very important. Uh, if, if it were not reliable, uh, it probably wouldn't be ex accepted in uh, newsrooms. But it's worked out well here, and now more and more stations, uh, both television and radio, are using systems such as this. And uh, overall, I think everyone is uh, pleased with the computerized newsroom. I love it. It's clean, it's quiet, it's efficient. Other than the little glitches sometimes when the computer gobbles up something right before you need it, um, it's wonderful. The only problem I've had is eye strain. That's just one problem. The other is training. Reporters can't just walk in off the street here without computer experience. Still, computers have produced accurate, efficient, and a timely news operation. The CBS network, in fact, has a system just like it, only bigger. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Wendy Woods. George, I guess one of the most spectacular applications of computers in the media is really in graphics and special visual effects. We've been dealing with words and other kinds of things mm -hmm. up to now. I'd like to introduce the two gentlemen who have joined us here. First of all, Dave Patton. Dave is vice president and co-founder of the Prism Arts Group. And next to Dave, Rodney Stock, president and founder of the Computer Arts Institute. George? It's so easy to get excited about this stuff. Tell me, what is the mix of hardware and software in the system? Well, the, the hardware, of course, is what makes it possible. There's a very unique hardware, which essentially is a high um, bandwidth memory that can store the entire image in one place so that it can refresh the television screen. And then all the interaction with how you manipulate images is a fair amount of software. It's actually a fairly sophisticated technology. When you think that a, a single image is a minimum, typically, of, say, a quarter million pixels, each one that has color to it, and the computer has to man manipulate, and you have to interact with a way to... This does plug into something that I can afford to buy in my computer store, doesn't it? This particular system plugs into an IBM PC AT. There are other systems that plug into even smaller machines, like an XT, or XT compatibles, if you will. You do want a hard disk in something like this? Typically, yes. Uh, you can fumble along <laughs> with a floppy for a short amount of time, but images are, uh, have a lot of data. Dave, let's, let's get to your system now. You've got the Aurora system up here. Now, this is running on an AT, but it's a pretty expensive piece of software, by the way, isn't it? What, what yes, would it, it is. cost? Uh, generally, I think now the base price is about $32,500. Okay. Now, show us what this kind of system could do, if you will, okay. and kind of give us a play-by-play -play as you do it. Well, currently now I have the Aurora image up here, which was animating. I'm going to call up one more picture um, out of the uh, memory. So you're using a standard AT keyboard plus your... your Paint pad. Yes. Now this was an image that was completely created on the uh, on the Aurora system, and uh, when it comes up here, I'll run the animation. It's got a simple cycle animation on it, which does that. That thirty-two thousand was for the complete package, wasn't it? Not just the software. That yes, it is. Yes, it includes the hardware. It, it can go. It well, doesn't go include the CPU or the monitors. No, no, no. I've got my computer. I spent another 32000 and I have this. Well, you still have to buy the monitors. Oh. <laughs> what do the monitors cost us? Uh, well, good RGB monitors, uh, maybe 2300 to 5600 I see. Dave, what do you have up there now? Well, I just called up a little drawing, um, a cigarette that was done by a man in Japan. Um, it's got a small piece of uh, color table with cycle animation on it to create the smoke. Um, 
the cigarette was completely, again, was produced on the system. I'll zoom into it a little bit. And you can take a look at it. What is the possibility now of doing some cycle animation where we actually move the ash uh, back and make it appear yes. that the cigarette is burning? That can be done on the system. This particular piece of animation doesn't have it, but it, it would be Do you have tools to that allow that to happen fairly easily? Yes, yes. Right. Um, There's another uh, higher level of this machine, another uh, member in this family that's more expensive but can do those kinds of things even more readily. And this kind of technique is something that you people teach at your school. Yes, that's correct. So if I went over there and took a course, I'd uh, be able to learn how to make that cigarette burn. Well, you bring your burning is tougher yeah. than making a smoke move, but we can make the smoke move e easily. Uh, yes. Quickly, Dave, we have time for maybe one more okay. uh, demonstration of your system before we get on to something okay. else. This is little, uh, another little color cycle animal. So how, how do you do that, what you're doing now? Well, basically, when I, when I stop this, you can see that it's, it's a matter of picking up a particular pattern on the oh. screen and repeating it. Uh, with a series of colors, and then the computer, basically, you, now, you now, cycle these colors. Now, that the stripe there is the places that that's going to be at. Yes, exactly. The snowflake is either background color, which makes it disappear completely, or it's snowflake color, and it shows up. And then you assign different colors to the... But there is a stripe, if we went back to this other picture here. For, no, there. Yeah, they all are. Uh, this right here is actually where that uh, color lookup table positions itself. Where, where the, I've decided it's going to position itself as it, as it moves, is that where right? The, where the snowflake, those are the positions of the different snowflakes, and you turn them on and off, so to speak, yeah. by signing the different yeah. colors. Rodney, I, I want to move along to the next dimension now, if you will. We have you know, the, the little things, the 100 buck programs you can buy for your little PC. We've got about a $30,000 range. There are million dollar computer graphics programs, aren't there? Things like PDI. Uh, we're going to roll a tape right now uh, and show some of that material. And okay. uh, as we look at that, maybe you can describe what it is we're seeing. All right. And tell us about the machine while we're waiting to see the tape, anyway. Okay, well, first of all, it should be appreciated that PDI, known as Pacific Data Images, is a production house. Okay, I think we can see, see it now. Yeah, just, just right. give us a little ex explanation how this kind of stuff is done. It's so and incredible. And they don't have, it isn't a machine that you purchase. They bought um, vaxes and ridges and wrote their own software to generate these kinds of images. The one you saw previously, Chrome, is one of their fortes in doing Chrome. This is a, uh, a very popular piece for a local station. Uh -huh. Most of their work is actually done for national accounts, such as this one here for NBC, which one has won a number of awards for the quality of the work. What, what would it cost to produce just one of these little logos, one of these little movie openings? Well, the price on this, this is three-dimensional graphics now. It's very different than what we saw in the paint system. And you go to a specialty house, and it's typically charged by the second. And it's typically two to $5,000 a second for a finished Ooh. result. Well, but then again, this is used over and over again nationally, and it's got to look good. You want you know, motion and color, and it's got to catch people's it's attention. Easy well, to look, look at this one. How do you do that? Uh, well, that actually, oh, keep watching. <laughs> yeah, that's fascinating. That's that's a that's a very fun piece, and you you actually work backwards is the way you do it. It's like oh, when you create it. Up. Sure, you break it up. Break right, it up. you have everything all come into one place. Well, really, what you did is you started one place and blew it up, and then yeah. put but, it in reverse. But, but now, is there an actual camera taking a picture at any point in this process? There are, no. There's no camera, there's no model. All digitally created. Digital computer created from the computer. It goes directly to videotape. It goes into a frame buffer and onto videotape. Could I ask you, this football here that we see, uh, that's a single image uh, that you can rotate and uh, look at from different angles. And right, any, any object is free to, to move in three-dimensional space. And notice that what's important here is the, the nice soft edges. Mm -hmm. You don't have flickering and what mm -hmm. is called aliasing in the mm -hmm. field. Um, there was a nice effect there with the blurring. It was mm -hmm. done mathematically. Look, look at this now. This is incredible. This, this piece, piece was interesting. Uh, this was their, their first major production. And it was done for Fantastico uh, show down in Brazil. And they actually coordinated it with live action. So what they did is they did the models and created the stills. And someone took a picture of that trucked on down to Brazil, and then with that one 35 millimeter slide, built a set. As Which we'll I think see we're going in to moment, see. Just, boom, yeah, there we so go. There, go. Now, so there we have the physical set to match up with the computer graphics wow. set to make it look as if they're all, they're dancing in space, as it were. And uh, that's yeah. actually more difficult than it sounds to do. Now, this is incredible. Tell me about this piece, Rodney. What this represents for me uh, is 
where 3D graphics is really wanting to go, that you, you try to use reality as your metric to establish your meter of how good an artist you are, and then that frees you to go to surrealism. So once you can model dinosaurs and you can model chrome, you can have chromosaurs. Right, but these are not models. I mean, this is all, again, digitally created. It's, it's all numbers in a computer. You sit there and, and you model it, but you model it with numbers in space and, and patches and, and objects, spheres and squares. And we we have, have just about a, a minute left, Rodney. What's the balance in terms of television and the movies? I know you worked at Lucasfilm and the special effects there. Is, are movies really driving this technology or television? It's primarily television. The, the movie industry, there's, there was the movie Tron, there was the movie The Last Starfighter, there was a short sequence for Star Trek III, II, The Wrath of Khan, done by the Lucasfilm people. I know of one production in, going on right now. But it's, it's really such a specialized special effect that um, although movies can put a lot of, afford a lot of money for a single effect, there are not that many people doing it. Gentlemen, we're out of time. This has been fascinating. Thank you so much. Now, there's no question computers are invading the media, the news business in particular. The question is, does that mean there's too much emphasis on technology, too much attention to form, and not enough to substance? Our commentator, Paul Schindler, has some thoughts on that. What's wrong with this picture? Well, to an old-time journalist like me, what's wrong is there's no longer any clacking teletypes in it, or pounding typewriters, or paste pots and thick pencils. Even broadcasters, who aren't considered real journalists by us print types, are slowly succumbing to the temptation to process their words instead of writing them. Now, I don't want to sound like a nostalgic fogey, and I don't want you to get me wrong. All my commentaries are composed on a word processor. I'd go crazy if I had to return to a typewriter. But something has gone out of the nation's media as they've gone into the electronic age. Newspapers, I'll admit, have fewer stupid typographical errors of the old type. Now they have brand new stupid errors. I've no time to describe the difference, but editing on a tube is different from editing on paper, and it's not always better. Now we're starting to hear the effect of electronic newsrooms on broadcasting. On the plus side, news is fresher. On the minus side, it doesn't flow as well as it used to because it's written faster, not necessarily better. And of course, sometimes computers crash, leaving broadcasters on the air with nothing to say. Is that so bad? I don't think so. That's my opinion. I'm Paul Schindler. In the random access file this week, the much talked about Christmas price cuts have started with Apple leading the way. A black and white 2C has been reduced from $12.95 to $9.95, and the 128K2E has been cut from $11.45 to $9.45. There were other price cuts on the Macintosh and the color version of the 2C. Meanwhile, IBM has rolled out its new AT, featuring a 30 megabyte hard disk. The upgraded AT will sell for just $200 more than the 20 megabyte version. Analysts say prices on the older model ATs should now come down. Apple has successfully stopped digital research from marketing its new GEM software. In an out-of-court settlement, DRI agreed to modify the GEM desktop interface along with GEM Paint and GEM Draw. Apple had claimed that the GEM software violated Macintosh copyrights by copying various icons and pull-down menus. Well, it's just been weeks since Steve Jobs quit Apple, but already there is a fan on the market for the Macintosh. Jobs had reportedly refused to put a fan in the Mac. Now a company named Bechtech is selling a Mac fan that it says reduces the Mac's inside temperature from 135 to 86 degrees. In our legislative update file, Senator Paul Tribble of Virginia has agreed to amend his proposed bulletin board pornography bill to meet the objections of the ACLU and several BBS operators. In testimony before a Senate subcommittee, witnesses said there were hundreds of boards across the country that deal with child pornography. After being courted by IBM, Apple, and just about every other American and British computer company, the Russians have decided to buy MSX computers from Japan. Their first order, more than a million dollars worth of micros to go into Soviet schools. Time for this week's software review, and here's Paul. Gosh, it's never done that before. It, you know, have you ever stopped to think that each of your $5 floppies has several thousand dollars worth of your time and effort on it? And for those of you with hard disks, multiply that by the storage capacity you have. It's frightening to think what would happen if something goes wrong and your disk fails. And it's even more frightening to think that most of you have never thought about it. Well, lucky for you, someone else has been thinking about the unthinkable, and they've come up with Backup, a package also known as Intelligent High Speed Backup and Restore Software. The problem, you see, is that a full backup takes so long that most people never do them, while partial backups create a substantial management problem. 
Backup takes care of all that for you automatically. Its simple, crystal clear menus guide you through every step you need to save today's work, this week's work, or this year's work. Now, I've been backing up a hard disk for years. Before I had backup, I made every mistake in the book. Since I got it, no matter how hard I try, I can't do anything wrong. Backup is $150 from InfoTools in Cupertino, California. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Paul Schindler. If you're into high-tech toys for your car, forget a cellular phone. Listen to this one. For $1,500, you can buy a computerized navigator that will constantly display a map of your location on a CRT screen and will also display the map of a destination point. The ETAC Auto Navigator does not depend on radio signals. It uses an electronic compass, motion sensors, and a computer map database. ETAC says its navigator is accurate to within 50 feet. Well, it's goodbye piano rolls, hello computer discs. The nation's biggest piano roll maker says it is converting 10,000 of its piano rolls into floppy discs that can be played back through a Commodore 64 or an Apple IIc. Finally, a computer scientist playing around with a $10 million Cray XMP has discovered what is so far the world's largest prime number. It's 2 to the 216,091st power minus 1. The world's new largest prime number has over 65,000 digits. It replaces the last largest prime number discovered two years ago that had a mere 39,000 digits. That's it for this week's Chronicles. We'll see you next time. The Computer Chronicles is made possible in part by grants from AFIPS, the American Federation of Information Processing Societies, a nonprofit federation of 11 national societies for computer professionals. AFIPS, leadership and service in computer and information technology. Additional funding is provided by McGraw-Hill, publishers of Byte. Byte's detailed technical articles on new hardware, software, and languages cover the latest in microcomputer technology worldwide. Byte, the international standard.